in order, pastoral epistle. Titus, chapter 3, I'm reading again what I read this morning, verses 1 through 8. And my text is verses 4 through 8a. I'm reading from the New King James Version, Titus 3, verses 1 through 8. Let us give our attention to God's holy word. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. And thus we end the reading of God's word. Let us pray. Our gracious and just heavenly Father, by your word and spirit, we pray that you will speak to our hearts and our heads this evening. We pray that you will help us to see our sinfulness and our need. We pray that you will let us know again the Lord Jesus Christ and the power of his resurrection. And we ask you to teach us from this text of scripture your holy will. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to Titus, whom he left in charge of the churches in Crete. These churches needed to be organized, they needed to have elders. They needed to combat the false doctrine that was being taught on the island of Crete. And he especially emphasized good works in this epistle, that those who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ should show it by the way they live. And you can see as you read this epistle several different passages where he mentions good works, even in what we read this evening. Tonight, if, if you think about this with me, I think you'll agree, if you ask any Christian who saved them, they obviously will say, the Lord. We all know that it is, it is the Lord who saves us, and I've entitled my sermon this evening, He Saved Us, because that's in this text. And yet sometimes I wonder how deeply this truth has settled into my being because I certainly don't act like it sometimes, many times, and it's painful to think about. God saved us. We tend to forget and lose consciousness of it. You notice in, in reading the Old Testament that time and again, the people of God remind themselves of what God has done for them in the past over and over again. As you go through the Old Testament, they are reminded that God chose them, 
God shows them his own special people. They are reminded that God delivered them from slavery and delivered them through the Red Sea. They are reminded that God called out Abraham and promised that he would be the father of a multitude of nations, of many, many people. And so they believed these things, they knew these things, they knew that God had made covenant with them and that they were in covenant with him. Over and over again, they were reminded by the different prophets and leaders of their nation religiously. We too should look back on our lives and see how the Lord has worked in them, what he has done for us. We get so caught up in all the things we have to do in our work and families and troubles and problems, we tend to forget. And so we want to remember that he saved us. God saved us. Paul had just finished describing the way we were in verse 3, which I preached on this morning, the way we were, the way we lived before conversion, and we saw that that's not a very pretty picture, and we already knew that, but we were reminded. We rediscovered that we were lost sinners and that we were in an estate of sin and misery and that we could not help ourselves. Not only that, we didn't want to help ourselves until God touched our hearts. But now... Paul writes, in contrast, about the kindness and love of God whereby he saved us. And notice in this text that all three persons of the Holy Trinity are mentioned. In verse 4, the Father, God our Savior. In verse 5, the Holy Spirit who washes us and renews us. In verse 6, Jesus Christ, our Savior. So tonight I want you to think with me on this We are saved by God, not by ourselves, not by anything else. So we must give credit where credit is due and offer sincere thanksgiving to God. He saved us. God saved us. We were lost, but he found us. We remember the great hymn, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind spiritually, but now I see because the Holy Spirit Open my eyes. The shepherd finds the lost sheep. We need to remember that. The shepherd finds the lost sheep. In fact, Jesus talked about this in one of his teachings. He talked about the man who had a hundred sheep. And yet, if one would go astray, he would leave the 99 and go find that one and bring it home. That's what he did for you, and that's what he did for me. So tonight, please think with me on this topic. He saved us under three divisions. First of all, God saved us when his kindness and love appeared. When his kindness and love appeared. appeared. Secondly, God saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Thirdly, God saved us through the work of the Holy Spirit. Through the work of the Holy Spirit. First of all, God saved us when his kindness and love appeared. And for that, I want to reread verse 4. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, a partial sentence, but it's enough to make one point, right? When the kindness and love of God appeared, his kindness is his goodness, his concern to aid those in need, his sense of pity for us. He did not, he did not leave us in our estate of sin and misery. He showed kindness to us. You know what kindness is. You know when someone is treating you with kindness, in contrast to when someone treats you in a rude manner. You also know when you do that toward other people. 
God is kind to us. He did not leave all mankind to perish in their sin. Ephesians 2, 7 says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God has been kind to us. And we were not kind to him. His kindness appeared. And then his love appeared. This word for love means love for mankind in general, as is translated in this translation, the love of God our Savior toward man appeared. His, his general love, this is not his electing love, but his common love. His common love restrains sin. His common love is all over the world and will remove the curse from this world in which we live. His love appeared. It did not remain hidden as some of us human beings are accused of sometimes. Hiding our love, God did not hide his love. He let it appear. He showed it to mankind. He could have condemned us all. We deserve it for we've sinned against him. But he did not. Have you ever been given a break? Sure you have. We've all been given a break uh, many years ago, probably before uh, most of you were born, but I remember it. Uh, McDonald's used to have a slogan, you deserve a break today. Well, I don't know if we deserve it or not, but sometimes we get a break. I remember a break that I got, and uh, this was a long time ago, but but I remember it because I don't like these situations. We were driving home from church one Sunday morning, my wife and I, and uh, I was going to seminary in Texas. We were on Hemp Hill Avenue. Uh, that was easy to remember because in Fort Worth, Texas, and I guess all of Texas for that matter, in the summertime, the heat would cause the roads to grow bumps, humps in the streets. And the car would just go like this, you know, when it got really hot. And I can remember that street name because we thought it should be Hump Hill instead of Hemp Hill, but it was, the street name was Hemp Hill. So we were galloping along, going home from church, and we come to a traffic light, and I sped up a little bit, and then I saw the blue light behind me. So the officer pulled us over, he chatted a little bit, and he said, well, since you're going home from church, I'm not going to give you a ticket today. Yes, you know, no ticket today. He gave me a break, and I was thankful, of course. But God did so much more than give us a break. He saved us, and we have thankful hearts because of that. He intentionally showed his concern for a lost world. The kindness and love of God appeared. It appeared. And it appeared especially when his son came into the world. God loved the world and sent his son. What a beautiful thing. His love and kindness appeared literally. When Jesus came on the scene, of course he had shared his love in the Old Testament period. Of course he had, but it really came in flesh when Jesus came. But God's love and kindness appeared to us personally when we were converted. When we were regenerated, that love appeared to us personally in our experience. That love and kindness led us to repent of our sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so God saved us when his kindness and love appeared. And that's what I wanted to say first of all. And secondly, God saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Verse 5 says, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy. 
he saved us. People continue to believe they are saved by works, even sometimes in spite of what they say. They act as though they earn salvation. I mean, after all, almost everything else you get in this world, you have to earn. You have to earn your paycheck. You have to go to work and do the work. You have to fill in those hours with honest work before you can get that paycheck, in most cases. If you're a student, you have to work for your grades. You get rewarded by your hard work. You've earned it. You deserve it when you receive a high grade if you've worked hard. Everything in life almost, we have to work to obtain. We earn it, but we do not earn salvation. We were incapable of doing righteous things. We didn't even want to do righteous things. We could never have done enough righteous things. It's not a mathematical formula. I've sinned 1,000 times, so I hope I can do by the time I die 1,001 good deeds, therefore I'm saved. Not by righteous things, which we had done. It's not that way. Not that way at all. In fact, even after we are regenerated, our best works, the best work you will ever do, that I will ever do in this life, are tainted with sin. We never did and we never could do righteous works that would earn our salvation. But, verse 5 says, God saved us because of his mercy. Grace and mercy are closely related. Grace is his unmerited favor, undeserved favor by which he saves us. His mercy is his compassion for us in our trouble. It, and combined with his readiness to help us, his mercy emphasizes our need, our weakness, our inability. His mercy. He saved us by his mercy. We were in a helpless estate. God was merciful. To us. You've heard the statement before when someone is in court, they are guilty, they know they're guilty, but instead of it, denying it, this time they admit it and they say something like, I throw myself on the mercy of the court. I don't deserve to be let go. I deserve punishment and I'm throwing myself on the mercy of the court, hoping and praying that the judge or the jury will be light on me because I'm guilty. The initiative in our salvation is taken by the Lord, of course. You did not find him until he found you. The sheep does not find the shepherd. You know, your dog might return to you. We've all heard stories of these precious animals who have been gone for a long time, months, maybe even a year or so, and they show up at their master's doorstep. It's a remarkable thing. A sheep won't do that. Unless a sheep can hear his master's voice, his shepherd's voice, he will respond to the shepherd's voice. He knows that voice distinctively. But if he doesn't hear that voice, he'll keep on going when he strays. He doesn't know any better. The shepherd finds the sheep. The sheep does not find the shepherd. God is rich in mercy. We're grateful. Praise the Lord for he is good. For his mercy endures forever. And had it not been for his mercy, you and I would still be in our lost estate right now. We would be in misery. Whether we knew the reason why or not, we would be miserable creatures. But thanks be to God 
In mercy, He forgave you of your sins. In mercy, He opened up your hearts and your minds to respond to Jesus Christ. And that's good news. So secondly, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of His mercy, God saved us. Thirdly, God saved us through the work of the Holy Spirit. In verse 5, still in verse 5, at the end of verse 5, through the washing of regeneration, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. Regeneration, of course, has to do with the new birth, being born again. The Holy Spirit regenerates us, gives us life, and plants new life in our souls. We repent and we trust in Christ. He must be born again, Jesus said. And just like you didn't cause and I didn't cause my natural birth, we don't cause our spiritual birth either. Neither do our parents. But only God does, the Holy Spirit. The washing of regeneration. The washing is spiritual. Spiritually, we are washed by the blood of Christ, which is pictured before us in water baptism. Water baptism does not wash the sins away. The blood of Christ does. And so there's a washing. But the Spirit also renews us, verse 5 says. He renews us back to the image of God, which we lost in Adam's sin. He is continuing to renew us, to change us, to sanctify us as he applies daily the death and resurrection of Jesus to us. The Holy Spirit does that. And the Holy Spirit was poured out on us abundantly. Verse 6 says, Whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. God poured out the Spirit on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The Holy Spirit was poured out upon the church at Pentecost in His fullness. The Holy Spirit had been working since creation, since the beginning of the world, and before He was working even, of course. But He came in His fullness and finally upon the church at Pentecost, as recorded in Acts chapter 2. And He comes upon each individual Christian at their conversion. It's hard to, to consider and understand that God, the Holy Spirit, lives within us. But He does. The Holy Spirit lives invisibly here. He has taken up residence in the church as a whole. He takes up residence in individual believers, everyone, abundantly. Every true believer has all there is to have of the Holy Spirit. The entire Holy Spirit is right there inside you. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's almost too good to be true that God the Holy Spirit could be living in us. But He is. Poured out on us abundantly. And as the Spirit works in us, we are justified. Verse 7 says, Having been justified by His grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. As the Spirit works in us, regenerating us, we are justified. He works in us. He comes into our lives. We repent of our sins. We trust in Christ. And God justifies us. He pardons our sins. He accepts us as righteous in His sight through the righteousness of Christ applied to us. He doesn't accept us as righteous because we are because we're not, we're not righteous within ourselves. But he accounts the righteousness of Christ to us just like he poured his wrath upon his son 
who was carrying our sin. God the Holy Spirit works these things, and God justifies us. This happens by grace, the grace of God. So we, the children of God, are heirs having the hope of eternal life. We are adopted children of God. And children may inherit things from their parents. And we inherit everlasting life from God our Father. It's his gift. It's what he gives to us. And everlasting life is not just life that is everlasting. It is not just life that is eternal. It is a higher quality of life. It is life in fellowship with God. It is a life that is lived in forgiveness. It is a life of peace and filled with grace. This is a trustworthy saying, Paul writes in verse 8. What has gone before in verses 4 through 7, this is a trustworthy saying. It is sure. You can believe it. You can depend on it. Some people's word you can't trust. Some people's word you can sometimes. God's word you can always trust. A trustworthy saying. What has just been said, God saved us. And that is the work of God's Holy Spirit. So we need to remember this truth, my brothers and sisters. We need to count on this, put it in our minds, not let it get away. God saved us. We didn't do 1%. We didn't do one-tenth of 1%. God saved us. We were lost sheep. The good shepherd found us. We must know from whom our salvation comes. Be humble, for God saved you, and we owe him everything. Thanks be to God. According to his mercy, he saved us. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for your mercy, for regeneration, for the Holy Spirit. We thank you for Jesus and his saving work. We thank you for his intercession for us right now at the right hand of you, Father. Help us to acknowledge you as our Savior and never forget it, Lord. And help us to sense and express the joy you have brought us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let us sing number 187. There were 90 and 9. Let's stand and sing number 187. <clears throat>